and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogla 66 Hour of the Truth. This today is uh, the 21st part of the reading The Secret History of the Jesuits, the book from Edmond Paris that he published in 1975. Probably even today I will go back into the book reading which I haven't done in the last reading because we were really busy with the Yugoslavia or let's say NDH uh, situation in the Second World War, meaning the independent state of Croatia that was cut out of the existing state of Yugoslavia. They cut out that they cut in pieces that whole state to install a Nazi puppet regime over there to persecute the Orthodox, the Jews and the Gypsies and others like Protestants also, if they were alive in that region most and for all to do their policy of convert or die. Now, um, there is something that I want to share with you even before I start this recording. And um, that's in my emails, you know, I have uh, contact with, um, with Tom Fress. And um, I asked Tom Fress, I, I, I wrote here an email to him, that, he's, uh, that I know that he mentioned that Avro Manhattan wrote in one of his books that um, that he read that what happened in Croatia, so in the NDH state that we are talking about now, in 1941 to 1945 is a foreshadowing of things to come in the United States of America. And could you please give me more info on that as soon as possible because I'm very deep in the Croatia subject and uh, as you can see of course from Brett's video that he uploaded last night, that was part 20 of this reading. And I wanted to continue this evening, today, on the 7th of February 2018, um, I wanted to continue this evening the reading and hope to include the info that you can provide for. So then I went to dinner and because I went to dinner I thought I better switch off my Skype because if Tom calls me then he will be frustrated because I don't pick up because I'm at dinner. <laughs> he got frustrated alright because he couldn't reach me because I was offline, he thought his Skype doesn't work, so I sent him, he, he sent me an email, and he said, I have said that Avro Manhattan in his book Terra over Yugoslavia, which is a book that I don't have as a PDF, it is not available on the internet for free, said in effect that what the Vatican did in Croatia is the model for what the Vatican intends to do in the United States. Tom says further, I am currently rereading the last chapter of that book, chapter 15, pages 121 through 136, entitled The Shape of Catholic Terror to Come. If I can find a link to an online copy of the book, I will send it to you so that you can read it yourself. Well, I looked that up and that book is not to be found. Even the whole book is for the moment... Uh, uh, ner uh, ner ner just wanted to say, that's Flemish nowhere to be found. Uh, it is out of print. It is not for sale anywhere. Otherwise we can get on Skype and I will read it to you and then you can judge for yourself whether or not I have put words in Manhattan's mouth. <laughs> My idea was never to say that Tom put words in Manhattan's mouth. My point was that I wanted to have this information that he provides here now via this little email. So what's my point? Well, first of all, I leave during the recording now my email on and of course I have left my Skype on. As you can see, I missed two calls from Tom Fress at 19.25 hours. Now we are almost an hour further. I hope, because I sent him back an email, that uh, he comes back on Skype and then he maybe will come and join us in this reading today and that would be wonderful. And, uh, you know, this is real live recording. I mean, it's real live recording anyway, even though it takes months for you to see that because I don't upload this video today. But you know that I make this with the camera, the desktop camera. So, um, without any further ado, I want to go to the reading where we left off in the book of uh, uh, the Vatican role in uh, the Eustacia genocide in the independent state of Croatia this paper that I took from the internet and that has most and for all quotes of the book from Cornwell on Hitler's Pope, as you remember. And um, I want to show you in between some pictures here and uh, let's see what we're going to get. Uh, we can get of course the picture of uh, uh, Hitler's Pope. This is this one here. We can get that here and have this in the meantime while I'm still reading this paper. 
We are on page 11 of 19 pages and we deal now with the American knowledge. The question is, what was the American knowledge of the atrocities of the satellite state of Croatia during the Second World War? And how far was America involved? Well, we read yesterday, I think it was yesterday, that the NDH declared war to the United States of America. So, they must know something about that state, right? Because a state that you are at war with, you probably know, okay? Now, let's read what uh, the author here has to say. When did the US government learn of the massacres and systematic genocide in the NDH? The US knew of the mass murders and genocide in the NDH in 1941. Yugoslav ambassador to the United States, Konstantin Fotik, Fotik, met with FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, on December 20th, 1941 and informed him of the massacres in the NDH. Fotik had sent a memorandum to FDR on December 5th, which described the massacres with a request that he be allowed to present further documentation and support. According to Fotik, on August 19, 1941, the chief of the Balkans desk of the United States De State Department had given him a report on the NDH, quote, comprehensive policy of extermination of the Serbian race in the independent state of Croatia, unquote. FDR was deeply shocked by the atrocities perpetrated against the Serbs. He expressed to Fotik, quote, his great sympathy for the Serbs. FDR spoke with admiration of the resistance. He told him after the war, the Serbs will rise again as a great people. We come here to the picture and see on the left, Andrija Artukovic, the interior minister of the NDH, Vatican legate Ramiro Marcone, the corporal and white guy, and Zagreb Archbishop Aloysius Stepinak at an Ustasha ceremony. This is Stepinak. Stepinak has made and been laid a cardinal, so sometimes I call him cardinal, sometimes I call him archbishop. Both titles are right. It just depends on the time when you see him. And here we have again another picture that you already saw a little bit smaller. But now come a few excerpts in this little paper that made me almost fall off my chair when I first read this. Eleanor Roosevelt had also learned of the mass murders and atrocities in the NDH in 1941 through 1942. The author Avril Manhattan met Eleanor Roosevelt at a private dinner party in Upper Brook Street, Mayfair, London, in the late 1940s. And this, by the way, um, what we are reading right here now, is an excerpt, and uh, you can see that on the number because this is put into um, uh, uh, into footnotes, Avril Manhattan, The Vatican's Hell Holocaust, from that book, is what we are reading right here. So, um, let me see, we have to get to where I just left off here. At the time he was researching Avril Manhattan for his book, The Vatican Holocaust, and writing his book on the Ustasha massacres in the NDH. In 1953, he published Terror over Yugoslavia, The Threat to Europe. That is the book that I asked Tom, uh, that, that Tom said, where he read that Avro Manhattan wrote, as he said in the email, um, Terror over Yugoslavia, Manhattan said, in effect, that what the Vatican did in Croatia is the model for what the Vatican intends to do to the United States. Yeah? So here we are still speaking about where Avril Manhattan was researching uh, before he was publishing that book. That's what we're going to read here about. In 1986, then, he published The Vatican's Holocaust, the sensational account of the most horrifying religious massacre of the 20th century. Avril Manhattan asked Eleanor Roosevelt if she had ever heard of the massacres and atrocities in the NDH. Now, what was her reply? Eleanor Roosevelt replied to Avril Manhattan on this occasion, quote, One of the worst, if not the worst, crimes of the war. 
I heard of them in the winter of 1941-1942. Neither, neither I nor my husband, FDR, at first believed them to be true. Yeah. When you hear of those kind of atrocities, a lot of people are standing in unbelief. Even quote-unquote initiated people like the FDR family, like Roosevelt and his wife. But what shocked me the most was this first sentence that she replied, and I'm going to tell you why just in a second. Eleanor Roosevelt, when asked if she has heard of the massacres and... Ah, oh, there's Tom. Hello, Tom. Hello, you got your mic on? No, I didn't have my microphone on. Ah, now you have it on. Tom, let me okay. let me tell you before you start anything. I am recording because I am in the session uh, doing the reading. And you are live in the reading right now. And uh, I was speaking about the email I sent to you and the reply you gave me and that we missed uh, each other on Skype. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am now reading in this paper that I found on the internet. And I'm just speaking about the, um, the answer that I read to you last time when we were on our... Um, Sabbath Bible study about Eleanor Roosevelt when she said one of the worst, if not the worst, crimes of the war if she heard of the massacres and atrocities in the NDH. Mm -hmm. So I thank you very much that you uh, come to Skype and I guess that you are all right with uh, being recorded now and that this is my live video of the 21st reading of uh, the secret history of the Jesuits. Are you all right with that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So establish that, that Tom is all right uh, with being recorded here. We're going to have now a live video. I've never done this via Skype. This is just wonderful. Um, my camera is going to recording all that. And um, yeah, Tom, I looked it up in the internet and you are right. The book Terror over Yugoslavia from Avro Manhattan is not available online and it is not even available to buy because when you go to some sites, it, uh, sites, it says um, that they are out of uh, print for the moment. But yes. um, you have uh, a copy of the book Terror Over Yugoslavia from uh, Avro Manhattan, right? Yes, I have in my hands a precious copy of this book. Mm -hmm. the, full the full title of the book is Terror Over Yugoslavia, The Threat to Europe mm -hmm. by Avro Manhattan. And you have asked me for substantiation for my previous and repeated claims that Avro Manhattan in this book said that what the Roman Catholic Church, what the Eustachi uh, and the Roman Catholic priests did in the former Yugoslavia in the creation of the modern nation state of Croatia, Roman Catholic Croatia, uh, is simply a, a working model of what the Vatican fully intends to do in the United States and everywhere else she is able. Okay. It's not At that I it's not that I doubt what you said, Tom, but you know it yes. is always nice of course when you do your research and you do your own readings that you can rely yeah. on facts like you are giving mm -hmm. us right now, you are sharing with us right now. Yeah. Um and that you can read from that book and that we can actually see that and that would be just wonderful. So I thank you very much yeah. for coming to the table and uh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, read read along with us this uh chapter of the book. Well, uh, to be perfectly candid with your listeners, uh, I have extrapolated that statement from the conclusion of reading this book, Terror Over Yugoslavia. Now, I leave it to you and uh, those with you to uncover the atrocities that the Vatican is responsible for in the former Yugoslavia to uh, conquer the Orthodox Serbs. It, it was a religious war to conquer Orthodoxy and then to take, to replace the Orthodox Serbian people with Roman Catholicism, to replace that government and to replace that land with a Roman Catholic people and a Roman Catholic government. That's what Croatia is today. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a it's a Roman uh, it's a Roman Catholic state, officially Roman Catholic. The religion is Roman Catholic. The state religion is Roman Catholic. The, the, the government of Croatia is Roman Catholic, where it used to be Serbian, in other words, Orthodox Greek Christianity. Okay? Yeah, now, I, remembering that, I, the, that, the, that the Orthodox Church separated in a schism with the Roman Catholic Church in, 50, in 1054 AD, and the Vatican has been waging an, uh, an all-out war against 
the Orthodox Church ever since. Yeah, that's right, and Tom. I, sp I spoke about that before in uh, other parts of the reading also to explain yeah. to my listeners yeah. why uh, and, 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 and even saying that um, Yugoslavia or Croatia was the buffer they had there for the Orthodoxy. And, uh, yes. uh, you know, that was the country actually lying between Greece on the south and uh, Soviet Russia on the top. Yeah, and I was also speaking about because in in the paper uh, it it was going about the Second World War when all of a sudden uh, the papers turned in the in the Battle of Kursk and the Germans had to retreat and the Germans couldn't win the war anymore, and the author of that paper said, well, that was um, uh, the, the church had a defeat there. I said, no, 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 the church just changed her plans. Instead of using the Germans to annihilate uh, Soviet Russia and to kill all the Orthodox over there, they left it over to Stalin, who then later killed at least 15 million people in his cleansing of the Orthodox mm. churches. And mm. with communism, they took all of <coughs> Eastern Europe and by that destroyed the original Protestantism that was in Eastern Europe at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I told that to my listeners already, but of course you yes. can't know that. But thanks so for Yugoslavia Yugoslavia was part of the of the Soviet Russia and and it was liberated from Russia and uh, Russia the Russian state religion is orthodoxy or the orthodox church and so uh Serbia was primarily orthodox they were called Serbians and when Yugoslavia was liberated from Russia then the Vatican uh took control and wiped out or attempted to wipe out the Orthodox Serbs and replace them with a Roman Catholic superstate. Mm -hmm. And now it is called Croatia. All right, in order to justify my repeated assertion that the actions of the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, with its, with its eustachy, that is Catholic action, and the priests of the Roman Catholic Church that they simply conquered ortho the Orthodox Church and made Croatia out of the two nations, made Croatia a Roman Catholic superstate. And that what the Vatican did to achieve all this is literally the working model of what the Vatican intends to do everywhere else it can. And I've made the assertion that it would be that it will be possible to do this here in the United States, particularly because of futurism, the new belief that the Antichrist is not the papacy, as was always believed throughout history by Bible-believing Christians, and also by the Protestant reformers, that now the Protestants don't believe that the papacy is the Antichrist. They do not believe that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. They believe in futurism, a brand new system or a school of, of, of uh, prophetic interpretation which places the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week in the distant future, okay, and the rise of Antichrist in the distant future. Whereas always before, Bible-believing Christians uh, understood that Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 23 through 27, re generally, usually regarded as the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, prophesied the coming of Messiah, and it was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. So the scriptural reference of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 23 through 27, Rome has foisted a, a, an alternative interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, contrary to what the Protestants had already believed. That was that this 70th week is cast into the distant future and won't be fulfilled. In other words, the 70th week of Daniel doesn't immediately follow the 69th week. There's a, a, something like a 2,000-year gap between the end of the 69th week, the prophetic week, and, and, and the, the beginning of the 70th or final seven years of time, and that it is then that some Antichrist figure will uh, sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews to allow them to build a temple in Jerusalem and begin animal sacrifices again, as if God were going to accept any animal sacrifices anymore now that his son, 
bore our sins upon his body and became the Lamb of God and, and reconciled us to God, made, made reconciliation for iniquity, and put an end to all animal sacrifices, as evidenced by the record in the scripture that God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And, okay, if you, understand, if you understand the purpose of that veil, it was to keep the holy of holies separate from the holy place. And only the priest once a year could pass through that veil and go in and make sacrifice for the whole nation of Israel. But once that veil was ripped in two, there was now no separation between the holy place and the holy of holies with the Ark of the Covenant and all. Which means God literally ripped the veil of that temple now that a permanent and complete and satisfactory sac sacrifice had been made. The Lamb which was slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ our Messiah the one whom Daniel prophesied to come during the beginning of the 70th week of his prophecy. And then after three and a half years, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life on the cross. And in confirmation that he did just that, God ripped the veil of the temple and put a permanent end to animal sacrifices. So Daniel's prophecy which is believed now to be fulfilled in yet in the future by an Antichrist figure, was literally fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And so Rome is building a global super state and intends to foist upon the world Roman Catholicism as though the kingdom of Christ is already here. And uh, it's just awaiting the, the rise of this Antichrist. Now, I know you know all that, and most of your listeners are understanding of this. But there is a tremendous persecution coming to this world, and particularly the United States and any Protestant nation in the world, that still regards the papacy as the Antichrist. From the first pope, through every succession of popes throughout history, including the current pope, and every pope in succession after him until Christ returns. The historicist view of Bible prophecy is the Protestant view of Bible prophecy. It is the only true interpretation of Bible prophecy, and it is proven true that history has proven it to be true. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible, and Croatia is simply a model of the persecution that is coming upon the world or any play, anyone in the world that resists the papal uh, the, assert, the the rise of the papacy to global supremacy. In other words if people will understand this you've, many of them have heard about the new world order that is coming but no one has defined it Okay, it's a, it's a subject that we've all heard about and many of us have researched about but no one has ever come right out and told us what it is. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. The new world order is simply the old world order reborn. The old world order is that order that existed prior to the Protestant Reformation when the Pope was believed to be God on earth and all the kings of the earth were subject to his rule. And they did his bidding. They were vassals of the, of the papacy. That all came to an end at 1517 A.D. when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church and declared the Protestant Reformation. And that was the overall uh, general acceptance of the Protestant view that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and the Protestant Reformation liberated nearly all of Europe from papal control. Okay? Can that I, began... Yes, go ahead. I just want to make a little comment here, Tom, what you say, because um, what you said, I spoke about this afternoon when I was recording with Brett uh, part 18 of our reading of Cold World Babylon, and um, we were speaking about Revelation 17, and I then said, okay, uh, about the New World Order, you just have to understand Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. With whom, speaking about the whore that sitteth upon many waters, the kings of the earth have committed fornication, right. and, the inhabitants of, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Mm -hmm. Now what does that mean? That doesn't mean 
uh, because it doesn't say with whom some of the kings of the earth have committed fornication, but all, yeah, That's with, right. with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now, who are the kings of the world today? The presidents, the prime ministers, the kings, the queens, the political rulers of the country, whether they be tyrants, fascists, communists, dictators, or quote unquote chosen, elected people in ruling positions. All right. of these are the kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. And all of these kings have committed fornication by going into bed with the whore that sitteth upon many waters. Yes. Now, I don't want to go into a complete dis uh, uh, analyzation of the book of Revelation, but it is easy for us to understand that God even predicted the quote-unquote new world order. And in the time of the Reformation, the Reformation brought the light into the world, the light in the form of the Bible that was not accessible to the people because the Bible was kept in closets in the Roman Catholic Church only in Latin. And when you were, if you were caught with the Bible in your hand as a layman, and surely that Bible was in another language than Latin, but probably the vulgar language, the language of the normal person, then the Bible was burned and you were burned along with it. That's right. And the Reformation, Luther, with the nailing of his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, and then later on translating the Bible into German and publishing that on a big, on a great scale, set all of Europe free and brought the light into the world that ended the dark ages, that ended the supreme role, the ultramontanism of the Pope, the self-installed right. vicar of Christ. Yeah? That's right. And then after the Reformation, we had something that is called the Counter-Reformation. And right. the Counter-Reformation was started by a new order of the Vatican, that was called the Society of Jesus, the Company of Jesus, or the Compagnie de Jesus, was uh, erected in 1534 by Ignatius Loyola and six other companions who were German, Portuguese, and, Fr uh, and Spanish. And they were, uh, they were ordained a papal order in 1540 by Antichrist Pope Paul III as the Order of the Jesuits. And they were the counter Reformation and their goal is to extirpate every Protestant thought and every Protestant man in this world and to That's bring right. the complete world under the volition of one man. Um, to make it easy and easy understandable, um, the motto of the Jesuits is the following the church to rule the world the Pope to rule the church and the Jesuits to rule the Pope. Yeah. It's easy as that. And with that can everything be, ex uh, be explained that happened from the founding of the Jesuit order on. And that's why I'm reading the secret history of the Jesuits because many people do not understand what the Jesuits are kind of people. And of course we are already in the 21st reading now and I have already done two readings of this um, uh, Yugoslavian um, conflict, the subject of the NDH, which is just an abbreviation of the Croatic term of the independent state of Croatia, the NDH. And uh, it is now very important, Tom, that we come to the point um, for what I was, uh, I was happy to, to have you here, uh, mm -hmm. to understand and to learn that um, you can tell us about what Avro Manhattan said in his book Terror over Yugoslavia, because in the meantime I was doing even book, uh, even picture searches on Google. Uh, that book is nowhere to be found. The Vatican's Holocaust, I found that and I have the picture here in the, in, in the camera right now, but Terror over Yugoslavia, I couldn't find the book and I couldn't find even a picture of that. Okay. Okay, the, the assertion that I've made that Croatia is a working model for what the Vatican intends to do in the rest of the world, and particularly the United States, can only be extrapolated from this book by reading the last chapter of the book. And that's my only way of, 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 of giving you my assertion that the Vatican is going to use what they did in Croatia as a working model for conquering 
Protestantism wherever it, is, it, it exists. And one of the greatest bastions of Protestantism in the world is the United States and possibly Britain. Yeah, and that also, sorry to interrupt you here, Tom, but that also is the reason why you named your ministry Inquisition Update, right? That's right. To, That's right. To because bring, there's an in to bring the American people, especially the American people, because you are an American, you are sitting there and you're doing every day a wonderful job in First Amendment Radio, reading books, discussing with people, interviewing people on the telephone. Well, that's time ago, but you did that in the past. But reading books, explaining books, reading documents, explaining documents, and trying to warn the American people of the Inquisition that is absolutely not that coming to the United States of America in the form of a Fourth Reich of the right. Nazi fascist regime that the Americans actually imported from Germany because when Germany died in the war they started Operation Paperclip and by that imported a lot of the fascist and Nazi ideas Not that they needed that, because the Jesuits have been on the high ground in the United States of America from the very beginning, and Nazism or fascism is the policy that relates the closest to the uh, Jesuit order. That is what they say themselves yeah. in their publication of Civilta Cattolica. Everybody can check that and read that for themselves. I just wanted to mention for my uh, viewers of the video here that this is if not the only, but one of the outstanding reasons why Tom Fress calls his ministry Inquisition Update to update the people of the world, and especially the people of the United States of America, of the coming Inquisition, because the Antichrist is not some distant person in the future. The Antichrist is, as P.D. Stewart puts it in his second book, the Antichrist is a woman, a life and well the papacy is the antichrist and the papacy rules as we just read in revelation 17 over the kings of the earth because the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her back okay. to you tom okay the title of this chapter which is number uh chapter 15 in this book the last chapter of this book terror over yugoslavia the threat to europe by avril manhattan The title of this chapter is The Shape of Catholic Terror to Come. Okay, The title alone indicates Mark, uh, Avril Manhattan's primary assertion that the world has not seen the end of Catholic terror. That the, the Catholic terror that was let loose in Croatia has only just begun. Okay? That's the assertion he makes with the, just the very, the very title of this chapter. The shape of Catholic terror to come. How is this future Catholic terror, now that, Roman, that, that, that Croatia has been made Roman Catholic by terror, how is this terror, this future terror of the Roman Catholic Church going to take shape? That, that's what we're, we're discussing. Now, now, Avril Manhattan says... More than a symbol, Croatia is a warning that the terror let loose within that small Balkan province was not an exceptional example of Roman Catholic power in action, but the rehearsal on a miniature scale of Roman Catholic tyranny ready to turn the whole of Europe into the gigantic Eustachiism of the future. In other words, the gigantic Roman Catholic superstate of the future. Okay? Now, I've, I don't want to repeat myself, but I have made the assertion many times repeatedly that what they did in Croatia is simply a working model of what they intend to do in the United States. I say this for my American listeners, but if you listen carefully what, Mar what Avril Manhattan has just said, this is a model of what the Vatican intends to do for all of Europe. Now, I leave it up to you to study the atrocities of the Eustachi in the former Yugoslavia and the nation in the creation of the modern nation state of Croatia and as it applies as a warning to Europe in which you live. Okay? 
My focus was to warn Americans, but the warning of this book is for Europeans. Again, the title of this book is Terror Over Yugoslavia, The Threat to Europe. Okay? Now, what I'm, I'm going to assert now is that the European Union, as it is today, is that gigantic Eustachianism of the future that, Mo that Avril Manhattan is talking about here. All of Europe is now under a union. It's not a Protestant union. It's a papal union. The papacy is the mover and the shaker and the instigator of the European Union. Okay? Now, I, as an American, could see the operations in Croatia under the former, uh, and the former Yugoslavia under the Eustachy as a model not only of what they, are, they have already done in Europe, but what they intend to do right here in the United States. Okay? All right, now he continues. He says the preparatory sta uh, steps for such a sinister design have already been taken behind a screen of ideological crusades with the most alarming results. Okay, Avril Manhattan is already seeing the preparatory stages for this gigantic Eustachianism of the future Europe. He says, to further its inroads, Catholicism does not always come forward open and openly championing its own cause. In other words, the Vatican disguises her overall activities with other names rather than the spread of Roman Catholicism, okay? Roman, the spread of Roman Catholicism is a secret that the Vatican must protect. And so she does her dirty deeds in the name of liberty or democracy or any other thing, okay? Now he continues, he says, very often, as in so many instances in the past, it that is, the Roman Catholic papacy, cunningly identifies itself with those who hosanna for freedom. Okay? The papacy is always allied with those who are the champions of freedom, right? The better to persuade them to fight with it against the quote-unquote foes of liberty. Western history is a witness to this. Okay? The Vatican always cloaks her aggressiveness and her attempt to establish Roman Catholicism all over the world in other guises, in disguises, usually in the name of liberty. Okay? Now, who, who would fight against liberty? Well, the papacy knows that it can harness the, the energy of the whole world in the name of liberty and then make sure that the Roman Catholicism is the it's achieved. All right? Now, he gives us a bit of history here. He says, following Constantine's edict, remember Emperor Con uh, the Caesar Constantine of the, of the old Roman Empire? He says, following Constantine's edict, and, and for those who don't know, Constantine decreed that Rome was a Christian st superstate, that the Roman Empire was now Christian always before the Roman Empire had persecuted Christianity and had persecuted Judaism, okay? But the empire was tottering, was ready to fold, and Constantine was trying to hold the empire together. And since the scriptures tell us that the, that the apostles and the disciples and the spread of Christianity, true biblical Christianity, that is that, is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that was literally overturning the world, turning the world on its head. The scripture even says that. It was turning the world on its head. And in order for Constantine to stay in power, he had to adopt Christianity. Otherwise, he'd have been overthrown. That's how popular Christianity had become at that time. So as a means of, of, of expedience only, Constantine, who w remained a heretic till the day he died, simply did what was expedient. He adopted Christianity 
as one of the prime religions of the Roman Empire, and he decreed that, that Rome was a Christian empire. That is the edict of Constantine. Now, following Constantine's edict, papal Christianity, that is, Roman Catholicism, unloosed such terror that in no time it stamped out the surviving creeds of the Greco-Roman world. Okay? Now, what, what I need to emphasize here is that, that Avril Manhattan first describes the edict of Constantine making the old pagan Roman Empire now Christian, and then he immediately starts, about, starts talking about papal Christianity. Okay, so why not Caesarean Christianity? Why doesn't he refer to it as Caesarean or Caesar's Christianity or Constantine's Christianity? No, he calls it papal Christianity. Because the Caesars of the Roman Empire were the ones who were now in power when Paul spoke to the Thessalonians. He said, he who now restrains will restrain until he is taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed. Second Thessalonians so, 2 verse 7. Sec That's right. So Constantine was the restrainer. And when Constantine left Rome and set up shop in Byzantium, that left a power vacuum in the Roman Empire, and the papacy took that role. So as soon as the restrainer was taken out of the way, the Antichrist was revealed. Oh, let me interrupt you there, Tom, for just a second. Yep. Um, you know that uh, we both were reading the book of Martin Luther um, uh, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Mm -hmm. And um, I uploaded a little time ago one of the parts and I called that uh, Emperor Phocas and Pope Boniface the third and uh, the 1260 day year prophecy uh, just today uh, no coincidence because in the coincidence don't happen I uploaded on my first channel your reading of Inquisition update Romanism and the Reformation part 18 and in that part 18 you deal in the beginning uh, of uh, Romanism and the Reformation on page 206 uh, where Henry Gretton Guinness says, quote, Gregory the Great in the 6th century, that means in the 500s, declared before Christendom that whosoever called himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist. In this he was doubtless perfectly correct. When Boniface III, shortly after the death of Gregory, took this title in the year 607, he became the precursor of Antichrist as fully revealed under Boniface VIII. Now I think this is very important to mention this Tom because most of the people think that the 1260 day year prophecy is from 538 to 1798 because that is common teaching especially from the Seventh-day Adventist Church out here in the world. But when you read books like The Two Babylons from Alexander Hislop that you and I have read, and when you read Henry Gretton Guinness's Romanism and the Reformation, and also Martin Luther in his book Against the Papacy, which he wrote in 1545, the last book, the legacy of his life, let's say, we learn that actually the first pope was this Boniface the third because the emperor at that time, ruling from Byzantium, or Constantinople at that time as it was called, Emperor Maurice was killed by Emperor Phocas. And that Emperor Phocas gave the title of Universal Bishop, of which Gregory the Great, the Bishop of Rome before warned, to Boniface III, and he became the first Pontifex Maximus, the first Bishop of Rome who had the spiritual power over the Eastern Church and over the Western Church combined. Therefore, Pontifex Maximus, the supreme bridge builder. I think this is just interesting to go here a little bit because you are just dealing with this history of Constantine and about how the man of sin was being revealed according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 and that we know that in that power vacuum that 
was made in the time between 320 something when Constantine went from Rome to Constantinople or Byzantium and uh, renamed it Constantinople and erected his empire over there, that power vacuum was taken over by the Bishop of Rome. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, does not speak of the Bishop of Rome at that time. They only speak of popes. But when we understand Henry Gretton Guinness's book good enough, when we understand Alexander Hislop's book good enough, and when we understand Martin Luther's book good enough, then we see that all the um, rulers in Rome on beforehand were just bishops. They were the bishop of bishops. Yeah? Okay, he was the most high bishop of all the bishops in the Western world, but he was only the bishop of Rome. But then came Boniface III, acknowledged by Emperor Phocas, and he was made the real, the first pope. That title belongs to him. And that was in the year 606, 607, and therefore you have the 1260 day dark age, let's say, period of the Bible that reigned from 606 through 1866. Do you agree with what I've just said here? Yes, I do, and we've talked about this many times. It's 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 uh, in addition to the information we're trying to give here. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole nother discussion, but the point that I always like to make is, and I think it's valid, that there are two 1260-year periods mm -hmm. that are marked both by Emperor Focus in declaring the pa the papacy universal bishop, but there's also the de declaration that the papacy is the Caesar, too, okay? Temporal right. and spiritual so, power, Tom. Temporal and spiritual powers, that's what we're yeah. talking and about. And he got his temporal power in 538, and he got the spiritual power in 606. That's right. It's and easy 1200 as years, And you can mark 1200 years, 1260 years from the beginning of both of those and find their ends. 1798 marks the 1260th year, and that was the year that uh, uh, <coughs> the papacy was taken captive uh, in the French Revolution by General Berthier, and unseated yeah. by General Berthier. And then, and then uh, the second was uh, during the time of the Protestant Reformation, if I recall, uh, when he was no longer the Caesar of, of Europe. The uh, Protestant the Re Reformation... Uh, unseated the papacy. He no longer ruled over the kings of the earth at that yeah. time. Especially, Tom, I do not know where the temporal power has been taken away of the Pope in 1798. The Pope has been taken captive. He has been thrown no. into prison in France. He died there. But after that, yeah. he had a successor and he ruled as the other ones did. And especially, we know <coughs> of, that, of that period, Pope Pius VII, who reinstalled the Jesuit order in 1814. So I do yeah. not know where there was a uh, quote unquote, um, taking away of the temporal power of the Pope in 1798, except for the little time that that Pope was thrown into prison and died there. But I am very sure about that taking away of the temporal power in 1866, when the um, uh, when the protecting guards of the French left the Vatican, and the Vatican then was actually closed. And, and, and I know that you spoke about that extensively in the uh, in, in the past that with 1870 they started the first Vatican Council. They, of course, had absolute their, uh, absolutely their spiritual power. By that it means they made Roman Catholic dogma the infallibility of the Pope with Pope Pius IX. And um, the spiritual power was there. But at that time the Pope locked himself into the Vatican in a famous quote-unquote prison with the keys of the inside and no pope after his election left the Vatican until 1929, when the temporal power was restored by the signing of the Lateran Treaty of Mussolini, who gave back the temporal power to the Vatican, who accepted from his um, Republic of uh, uh, Italy Republic, Italian Republic, who accepted the Vatican as a state again, and by that gave the pope back the temporal power. Okay, I, I hope we've settled that issue, but the point I was originally making is that Avril Manhattan is acknowledging right here in his book the continuity between Constantine's Roman Empire and the Papal Holy Roman Empire. Nothing had really changed. 
listen again to what, what Avril Manhattan says. He says, following Constantine's edict, papal Christianity unloosed such terror that in no time it stamped out the surviving creeds of the Greco-Roman world. Okay? Now, I think this is a directly or an indirectly a reference to the destruction of the three uh, uh, um, the three kings, the three little horn, the three horns that the little horn uprooted. The in, Heruli, in the Ostrogoths, Prop. and the Vandals. That's yeah. right. The Gothics, the Gothic nations. Mm -hmm. All right, but whether or not it is, we'll just continue. He says, in the Dark and Middle Ages, that is the Old World Order, as I've said. Mar uh, Avril Manhattan says, in the Dark and Middle Ages. Whoever dared to think independently of Roman Catholicism was mercilessly silenced by Catholic sword and by Catholic uh, fire. Okay? That's the way it was. Anybody or any group of men or any governments or anyone who spoke contrary and independently against the Roman papacy and the Roman Catholic religion was mercilessly silenced by sword and by fire. Okay? That's exactly what happened in Croatia, too, isn't it? By sword and by fire. Our Avril Manhattan makes it certain that of the Serbs, the Orthodox Serbs, a third were forcibly converted to Roman Catholicism, a third were exiled from the land, and a third were slaughtered, butchered. Okay? That's how sword and fire manifested itself in the former Yugoslavia in order to create the modern superstate of Croatia, the Roman Catholic superstate of Croatia. All right? This is in the recent past. This is very recent, the creation of, Rome, of, of Roman Catholic Croatia. Now he says, following the birth of Protestantism, the Catholic Church, in its attempt to annihilate it, plunged Europe into a sea of blood. Okay, So we've already seen fire and sword in Europe against Protestantism this time. The target in Croatia was Eastern Orthodoxy. The target in Europe after the Protestant Reformation was Protestantism. And the Roman Catholic Church plunged all of Europe into a sea of blood. Okay, It wasn't the Protestants who turned Europe into a sea of blood, as I so often hear, with the hair standing on the back of my neck. It was the papacy that turned Europe into a sea of blood to annihilate Protestantism. Okay? The first, the, 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 the Council of Trent, which took place right after the death of Martin Luther, was led by the Roman Catholic Jesuit order. And at the Council of Trent, there were 100 anathemas laid against Protestantism, 100 damnations leveled against Protestantism, and the Council of Trent literally became a declaration, an open and public declaration of an all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism. Okay? And that's how they turned all of Europe into a sea of blood. All right? Protestantism had spread from Germany and Poland and, and all over Europe. The northern nations, Finland, Spain, or Switzerland, uh, uh, Denmark, England, uh, you name them, they all became Protestant. They all became of the common belief that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and he has no right to rule anybody. And so they... So, so the Protestant reformers liberated all of Europe from papal tyranny. And Rome declared an all-out war to reestablish her sole sovereign rule over formerly Protestant Europe. And she's going to do it by the same means that she overthrew 
Greek Orthodox, the Greek Orthodoxy out of the former Yugoslavia. All right, that's the whole point Avril Manhattan is making here. Now he continues, he says, Catholic absolutism, that is unchallenged Roman Catholicism, owing to its ability to attack any man, any culture, or any civilization anywhere at any time, if permitted to grow, will repeat all the horrors of the past. Catholicism and totalitarianism being indivisible. Okay? What Martin what Avril Manhattan is saying is that Catholicism and totalitarianism are one and the same. Rome's not going to share his kingdom with Jesus Christ. The Vatican is not going to share his kingdom with the Bible. The Vatican is going to rule unchallenged every nation on the planet, not just Europe. That's what Avril Manhattan is acknowledging here, what he says. On that count, he continues, he says, like Siamese twins, the two cannot be separated. In other words, Roman Catholicism cannot be separated from totalitarianism. It's the most totalitarian philosophy in world history. Okay, and it's never going to relent of its aim for complete, sovereign, and unfettered totalitarian rule of the whole world. Now, just as we would expect, when Jesus returns, there aren't going to be any challengers. The papacy, which claims itself to be the vicar of Christ, or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, claims that same prerogative to rule this world unchallenged. And that's been demonstrated throughout all of history, the links and the brutalities and the tortures and the fires and the sword that Rome is willing to expend at any time his authority is challenged. Protestantism was the greatest challenge to papal supremacy the world has ever seen. And so there is an all-out war against Protestantism. We saw how the Vatican dealt with orthodoxy in Croatia. We can expect the same or worse in her war against Protestantism. That's what Martin Luther, or Martin Luther, that's what Avril Manhattan's trying to tell us. Like Siamese twins, these two, Roman Catholicism and totalitarianism, totalitarianism cannot be separated. Catholicism, therefore, will automatically attack whatever is not Roman Catholic. During the last few decades, the Orthodox Church was selected as the chief target of a Catholic war, which is far from having ended. All right, so the former Yugoslavia and the Orthodox Serbs were just her stepping stone. Now, he says, since the emergence on the world stage of communism, the Catholic war on Protestantism has apparently relaxed. Okay? So, so her war would have been immediately picked up against the Protestants, except for the fact that communism posed a greater, more immediate threat to the Vatican. So the Vatican just put the war on Protestantism on the back burner to deal more directly and more immediately with the with the communist threat. Now, why does the Vatican see the communism as a threat? First of all, it's the seat of orthodoxy in the world. Okay, the Orthodox Church is the state religion of Russia. So when when the Vatican says it's against communism, remember she always cloaks her true intentions. When the Vatican declares an all-out war against communism, what it's really declaring is an all-out war against Eastern Orthodoxy, or Russian Orthodoxy, the Orthodox Russian Church. So, Avril Manhattan is making this clear. He's already told us that the Vatican always cloaks her true intentions. 
All right. Now, what what do, what do we want? What 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 is the mantra here in the United States? Well, we have to fight for freedom. We have to fight against communism. We have to go to war against Russia to stop the spread of communism. Which really means we have to stop the spread of orthodoxy. And so here you have a Protestant nation going to war or in a cold war or any other kind of war against the Orthodox Church in Russia. And let me tell you, and just as Avril Manhattan is going to tell you in the reading of this book, when the Orthodox are brought back to heel and under papal supremacy, when they have turned the Orthodox Church back, <clears throat> back to the Roman Catholic Church, they intend to do the same thing against the Protestants. I think there is a, a little note that I have to bring in here, Tom, and that is the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, which installed communism in the in Russia, and installed the Soviet Union, uh, the, um, the the communist state of the Soviet Union in the time. That was done for multiple reasons. One of the reasons was. Uh, they wanted to punish the Russian Tsar, who had given support to Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War in, the, in, in, the, in America in the 1860s. And the second point was that the Tsar was the protector of the Orthodox Church. And by killing the Tsar and his family and installing a communist regime that they had practiced in the 16th and 17th century in Paraguay with the Paraguayan reductions, they had the possibility through communistic atheism to kill off the orthodox and that's actually what stalin later did when he killed more than 15 million orthodox people over there so we have to make the people understand tom that russia was orthodox but the soviet union was atheistic communism declared atheist their state religion if you can say it that way it was the same in Eastern Germany, you know, the German Democratic Republic, just a kilo few kilometers from where I was born in Hamburg, starting, was the heart of Protestant Germany. And since communism was installed there after the Second World War, there was not much Protestant Protestantism left there anymore. The communist agenda was used to spread atheism and by that to kill off orthodoxy. I just wanted to add that. Okay, very well taken. Rome will use any means or method to destroy orthodoxy. And the, the lesson that Avril Manhattan is trying to tell us is, study well Rome's strategies to destroy the orthodox church, because Rome will use the same strategies to destroy the Protestant church. Yeah, whatever means necessary, because the end justifies the means. Yes, and they always control both sides. They control the side of fascism and they control the side of communism. And then they wage these two against each other. And the only one who loses are the real enemies of the Roman Catholic Church in the meantime. Okay, so that's how Rome cloaks her religious wars. Okay. Now he says, during the last few decades, the Orthodox Church, and remember this book was written back in the 1960s, so the last few decades, we now have a time period. He said, during the last few decades, the Orthodox Church was selected as the chief target of a Catholic war, which is far from having ended. Since the emergence on the world scale of communism, the Catholic war on Protestantism has been apparently relaxed. Okay, there's been a ceasefire, temporary ceasefire out of necessity because the Vatican needed Protestant USA to help in the war against godless communism, right? And the destruction of the Orthodox Church through atheist communism. Okay, so I'm just reiterating what you've already said. Aver Manhattan knows what this is all about. And he says, um, hence the absence of Protestant Croatia's the absence of Protestant Croatias. What's he saying? There has been no war against the Protestant Church like the Eustachi and the Roman Catholic Church waged against the Orthodox Church in Croatia. 
Now, if there were going to be in the world any Protestant Croatias, any nation in the world that was Protestant, that Rome intended to attack the way it attacked the Orthodox Serbs in Croatia, what nation would that be, Irk? Possibly Germany? Yeah. Po possibly England? Possibly the United States? Whatever Manhattan is doing by this suggestion, if you l listen carefully to what he's saying, that the war on communism simply put a temporary hold on the Protestant Croatia. Rome intends to go about the same business in its formation of Croatia in an Orthodox Christian nation and to do it in a Protestant nation. Avril Manhattan is predicting a Protestant Croatia as soon as communism is taken out of the way. He's predicting that somewhere in the Protestant world there will be another Catholic action, another Eustachy, to create another Roman Catholic superstate out of one that was formerly Protestant. That's what Martin Luther, or I've been reading Martin Luther lately. That's what Avril Manhattan is asserting here. That's normally Make no you mistake. Have, you have been reading Martin Luther for the last month, so that's not Yes, <laughs> yes. So Avril Manhattan is predicting a Protestant Croatia. As soon as communism is, is, is sufficiently dealt with. In other words, when the war against Russian and Greek orthodoxy is ended, the war goes to the Protestants. The war is going to be waged against the Protestants. Now he says... But to deduce from this that there will be no Protestant Croatias in the future is not only absurd, it is unreal, it is also dangerous. Okay? Avril Manhattan says, if you think for one minute there's not going to be a Protestant Croatia, you are treading on dangerous territory. In other words, don't take your back off, your, uh, your eyes off the Roman Catholic Church. Your day is coming, you Protestants. You've seen with your own eyes how the Vatican dealt with Orthodox Russia and Orthodox Croatia. And if you think being a Protestant is going to save you from the same kind of hatred and fire and sword and persecution and Catholic action... You've got another thing coming. He continues, he says, there will be no Protestant Croatias as long as A, Roman Catholicism is not permitted to acquire real power or total power, and B, it needs the support of powerful Protestant nations such as the United States of America. Now, why does the Vatican need the help and support of a Protestant nation such as the United States of America? Well, because we're the only power in the world that can confront Russia and continue the war, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, against the Orthodox Church. You see? Vatican, the Vatican, or rather the Jesuit strategy, is always to use the, the strategy to pit Rome's most lethal enemies against one another so that they destroy one another so that the Vatican doesn't have to do it. What Avril Manhattan is revealing here is that the United States of America, Protestant USA, is a vital asset in the right hand of the Roman Catholic Church against the Orthodox Russia and the Orthodox Serbia and any other Orthodox nation. That we are literally the battle axe of the Pope in his crusade against Orthodoxy. 
And what do you think will happen once the United States, with or without their knowledge, have successfully conquered the Orthodox Church in Russia and the Balkans? Then the war shifts against us Protestants. After we've shed our own blood, our own gut, our own treasure, gone into incalculable debt against Rome's enemy, the Orthodox Church in Russia and the Balkans, through NATO and the Cold War and all these other things, then the war comes to the United States of America. The war comes to Europe, Protestant Europe. That's what, Martin, that's what Avril Manhattan is asserting. And he's absolutely correct. He's, he is saying that what the Vatican did through the Eustachi and the Roman Catholic priests of the former Yugoslavia in destroying orthodoxy in Yugoslavia, they have created a super state called, a Roman Catholic super state called Croatia. Right now, the the war against orthodoxy must continue in Russia and the rest of the Balkan states, and the Vatican needs the United States of America to prosecute that war. And once that war is over, then the war against Protestantism begins in Europe and the United States of America. Now he continues. Protestants ready to come to terms with it, that is the fact that we're next, are preparing for suicide. Did you hear what Abraham Manhattan says? He says Protestants, ready to come to terms with it, are preparing for suicide. Why do you think Protestants would prepare for suicide? Why do you think Avril Manhattan would suggest that Protestants are preparing for suicide? I'll tell you why. Because they have bit the Jesuit lie called futurism. Futurism suggests that the Antichrist is not the papacy, never was the papacy, never will be the papacy. The Antichrist is a single individual that comes just seven or three and a half or just immediately before Christ's literal return. And we don't have to worry about the Antichrist. We'll all be raptured out before. Yeah, oh yeah, they say we're all going to be raptured out before the Antichrist comes. You know, that, that, that was never even heard of in the world until about 250 years ago. 250 years is all. It's the newest kid on the block. What was always believed before, from the period of 250 years ago all the way back to the first century church, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel. That's the truth. And history proves it. So, for the last 250 years, the Protestant pastors and the Protestant people of this country have embraced futurism that the Antichrist is not the Pope. It's a single individual that comes just before Christ's return. We don't have to worry about him now. We can just continue to sing in the choir and praise Jesus. But when the war against Protestantism begins to find... Oh, when the war against Protestantism begins to be prosecuted in Europe and in the United States... Protestant pastors will begin to realize that they are the ones, the very ones, that have foisted upon us the, the futurist lie. And the responsibility of that has led to this whole Protestant nation literally fighting the papacy's wars for him. At our own expense, in treasure, in blood, and in guts. We betrayed Christ. The war should have been against the papacy always and forever. But instead we find ourselves now the most powerful Protestant nation in the world whom God has blessed beyond any imagination has been literally the battle axe of the Pope against all of his enemies. 
And when we've conquered all of the papacy's enemies throughout the world, the sword of Rome will be turned upon us. And Avro Manhattan comprehends this and is trying to warn us in this book. And what's going to happen to those pastors who've spent their whole lives teaching futurism? That the papacy is not the Antichrist, it's a single individual at the end of time, possibly a Jew. What do you think they're going to do? They found their whole lives fighting against Christ. What do you think they're going to do? Avril Manhattan says, Protestants ready to come to terms with it are preparing for suicide. He said, for Catholic peace with them is anything but peace. What's Manhattan telling you? If you're a Protestant, truly Protestant, you seek no peace with the Antichrist of Rome. And you speak out against these wars that we're fighting for Rome's behest. There is no such thing as Catholic peace with a Protestant. We have peace with Christ, not with Antichrist. We pray against Antichrist. We pray for Jesus' soon coming kingdom. And when he comes, there will be no papacy in the world. The papacy will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The papacy will be destroyed without hand. The world will finally know who the real Antichrist is. And all the Protestants and all the great martyrs of Jesus for all the centuries prior to about 200 and 250 years ago will be vindicated. Those who stood at the stake and were burned to death for insisting that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, they will be the champions of Christ. And all the Protestant preachers today who preach futurism will have found them themselves spending their lives at war against Christ. There's going to be no peace between Christ's people, the true body of Christ, and the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. There is no peace. Never will be any peace. There's no grounds for peace. There's no common grounds. There is no peace with Antichrist. He says, for Catholic peace with them, the Protestants, is anything but peace. It is not even an armistice. It is a de deceptive law which will be broken just as soon as Roman Catholicism has judged it safe to charge them with a brandishing sword. That's Avril Manhattan speaking. Avril Manhattan is telling you Protestants, you're next. As soon as you conquer the Orthodox for the Pope, you're next. Whether you live in Europe or the United States or anywhere else in the world, you're next. The war that was declared against you at the, at, at the Council of Trent will be waged as soon as we dispatch the Orthodox. As soon as you dispatch the Orthodox for us. And then we turn our swords against you. Avril Manhattan wasn't even a religious man. Avril Manhattan just studied the Vatican like a brain surgeon studies brain surgery. And like we all should study the Bible, Tom. That's right. Because and Avril Manhattan, having no understanding of the scriptures, clearly saw, foresaw, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Jesus told us that we will not have peace in this world, but tribulation. That's right. Now he says, he continues, he says, Catholic anti-Protestant odium, odium, rather, hatred, in other words, Catholic anti-Protestant hatred is burning now as ever. To believe that, because it is not visible, it is dead, is to be deceived. Okay? Martin or Avril Manhattan is saying, that if you think this ecumenical movement is proclaimed by Vatican Council II is any hope for Protestants, you've got another thing coming. The Vatican's hatred for Protestantism is just as alive and well today as it ever was, especially during the time of the Protestant Reformation in 1517 and on. Rome is never 
going to forgive or forget the Protestant Reformation. Okay? He says to believe that because it is not visible, it is dead, is to be deceived. Catholic hatred is covered only by a layer of ashes. For the incautious, those who are not careful, that is proof that the fire was extinguished long ago. Okay? Yet, were its smoldering embers to be even slightly disturbed, unexpected flames would leap up with the ferocity and the violence of old. In other words, Martin Luther said, or Avril Manhattan says, all you got to do is kick those ashes just a little bit, and the, the Counter-Reformation will leap into a bonfire overnight. The war against Protestantism just seems to be smoking embers right now. But after the Orthodox are defeated by us Protestants here in the United States of America through NATO and all of our military actions around the world, all Rome's got to do is take her naked toe and kick those ashes a little bit, and the hatred for Protestantism will become a raging inferno. He says, notwithstanding the overwhelming reasons which, since the, ad the advance of world communism, have forced Catholicism to seek the alliance of Protestantism, Catholic anti-Protestant sentiment can still be seen at work both in Europe and the Americas. Okay, he's repeating himself here. Just saying the same thing in different words. He said, notwithstanding the overwhelming reasons which, since the advance of world communism, have forced Catholicism to seek the alliance of Protestantism, that is, the alliance with the United States, Catholic anti-Protestant sentiment can still be seen at work both in Europe and the Americas. To be sure, it's not operating on a large scale. It is not even systemic. It is uneven, haphazard, and occasional. Yet, for that very reason, the more significant because when carefully scrutinized, it emerges as a well-defined pattern, the pattern of a potential, full-blooded, anti-Protestant persecution should, should Catholicism ever acquire all the power it acquired in Croatia. So have I justified already just reading the first few paragraphs of the last chapter of this book my assertion that what the Vatican did in the former Yugoslavia to create the modern superstate of Cro the, the modern Roman Catholic superstate of Croatia is simply a working model for what the Vatican intends to do both in Europe and the United States of America. Now, your studies with your listeners has to do with the Eustachi and all the atrocities they committed against the Orthodox Serbs. The butchery, the unrelenting butchery, the butchery was so savage that it even embarrassed Adolf Hitler. And it was conducted by Roman Catholics, many of whom were Roman Catholic priests. This has been proven, and the books that you're reading and the pictures that you're showing your listeners verify this very fact. Avril Manhattan is just warning us that when the war against orthodoxy is over and the Vatican has triumphed over orthodoxy, she will have all the more energy to go after the Protestant heretics, wherever they may be. The few Protestants, Tom, that are left after the futurism and mm -hmm. ecumenical working of um, Vatican mm -hmm. II, of course. Yes. Because let's... Let's let's be honest. Uh, even the United States of America, that was inhabited by more than ninety percent of Protestants in the time of its inauguration in 1776, mm -hmm. today all these Protestants, if they are in any churches, all the churches they go to are 501c3 um, government agency churches, in the mm -hmm. way, 
and the pulpits of the Protestant churches have been infiltrated by the Jesuits since the beginning of the 19th century, especially since 1850, in England and in the United States of America. And by that, that means that all the pastors have been taught futurism. And yeah. they only teach futuristic Bibles. I mean, I am not sure. living in America and I'm not going to church, but I, I bet my behind that when you go to any church in America, there is not so often found a church, and especially not in, when, when you go to these mega churches, like you have with Joel Olstein and, and, and all these uh, quote-unquote preachers, where something is taught from the King James Version of the Bible. And we always have to remind ourselves that God is able to keep his word perfectly all through the ages. And he did that in the English language with the authorized version of the 1611 King James Version. But mm -hmm. since the middle of the 19th century, only forged Bibles have come out with oh. the names of NIV and NASV and mm -hmm. RSV and all these different names. And I, I don't even want to mention them. It's too much to do so. And they all are Bibles that do not reflect the true word of God anymore. So, sure. what kind of Protestants are these Protestants, Tom? We have had this discussion. We have uh, we are we are having the discussion almost every week that we say, well, uh, to be a Protestant, you first and for all have to know what are you protesting. Yeah. And most of the Protestants don't have any idea what they are protesting. They don't have any idea where the word protest even comes from. They have never heard of the Diet of Spires in 1529. Yeah. They have not heard of the Augs uh, Augsburg Declaration. Well, well, let me let me just let me just put it easily for your listeners. Yeah, please. Protestants Protestants today don't even know who the Antichrist is. No. Oh. They think it's somebody in the future. Never would they ever accept the fact that they're actually making ecumenical union with the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel, the papacy. That's just how delusional the Protestants are in this country. There's hardly any Protestantism left in the country. The Protestantism was built on two foundations. Number one, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. We serve only him. And the second plank is, the papacy is the counterfeit Christ, and we will never obey him. We will fight against him. We will pray against him. We will stand on the scriptural truth, the prophetic truth, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. We are for Christ. We are against the papacy. Now, there isn't one in probably a million Protestants in this country that have a clue what I'm talking about right now. That's right. But, um... now, now, the strategy of the Ustashi in Croatia was to forcibly convert at least a third of the Orthodox. In other words, put them in their churches, round them all up, put them in their churches walk in with a priest, splatter a bunch of holy water on them, and force them to confess the Pope as the head of their religion, and, and formally convert to Roman Catholicism by being baptized by the priest. And then the priest would walk out of the church and light the church afire and burn them all. That's what they did in the former Yugoslavia. They forcibly converted Rome, uh, uh, Orthodoxy, Orthodox Serbs to Roman Catholicism, and then they burn them alive. Yeah, their plan was to deport a third, convert then to deport a, third, a third, and kill a and, third. And then kill a third. So, the strategy in the United States is, well, since the Protestants are no longer protesting anymore, it might not be necessary, it might not be necessary to forcibly convert them to Roman Catholicism, because they're voluntarily converting to Roman Catholicism because they no longer believe the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, that they believe that the Roman Catholic religion is a Christian religion, and it's, it's the opposite. And yet they are seeking ecumenical unity with the Pope. They're signing documents of capitulation to the papacy and uniting with the papacy on so-called common causes. But what's left? 
since forcible conversion to Roman Catholicism really isn't all that necessary now, any holdouts like me and like you will either be forced out of the country or will be killed. And who do you think is going to be killing us and forcing us out of the country? Oh, the so-called Protestant, Tom. Our quote-unquote yeah. Christian brothers. Yeah, those who have united with the papacy and trying to unite all of Christianity in the name of the Pope, they're the ones who are going to be persecuting us. The ecumenical evangelibellies, as you like That's to right. call them. That's right. The ecumenical evangelibellies, those who are sitting right in the pews, right alongside of us, they will turn against us and kill us with the same ferocity that the papacy slew God's saints all throughout history. Brings into mind the saying of Jesus, don't cast your pearls before swines because they will trample them and they will, and then they will turn against you and they will rend That's you, right? That's right. That's right. But still we cannot stop bringing the word out. No. Nope. No. Nope. We can't stop talking about this. So, listen, this whole chapter that I've just begun to read is all about my assertion that what the Vatican did in Croatia is literally a working model for what the Vatican fully intends to do, not just in the United States, but in all of Europe. Now, I could read the rest of this chapter if that's what you want me to do. Well, but I've already clearly made my assertion valid. I think, Tom, that you wonderfully made your point and uh, have come to an hour and a half in this broadcast, which is by that uh, the longest broadcast of the reading Secret History of the Jesuits, and I haven't even read one word of the book, actually. But that's that's great. I'm, I'm very thankful and very grateful, Tom, for that you were coming here. And yes. in the meantime, uh, when you were reading, I put pictures here in the video uh, uh, from, uh, for example, this book, Genocide in Croatia. I don't know if you know that book. It's a 64 yes. pages book, and it has a lot of... I have a copy of it. Yeah, and it has a lot of the atrocities here in picture. So I showed the pictures during your reading of Avro Manhattan. I was showing a picture here in Amaz uh, of Amazon of the book Terror over Yugoslavia, the threat to Europe, that is currently unavailable, and there is not even an image available. So I was really looking through the whole internet, and I couldn't even find one picture of this book of Avro Manhattan. It is just not available. And yeah. um, no, I, I thank you very much, Tom, that you did what you just did, that you uh, did the reading, that you accompanied me, uh, accompanied me here today. And I think that you made your point very clear. And um, that's all, all I wanted, you know. I, I knew that you mentioned that a few times, and uh, it's great uh, that you could, uh, could uh, use the opportunity today to call me on Skype. And um, during my reading of this uh, book, uh, The Secret History of the Jesuits, you could uh, fill in the gaps. Um, with Avro Manhattan from what you were reading from a book that is for us not available anymore. So yeah. guide that book, Tom. And uh, I don't know, have you read that in the past on First Amendment Radio in your, in your Inquisition Update program? Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I'm ready to re read it again. Ah, okay. I just I, I, I've never, I've never uh, attempted to read a second time any of the books that I've, that I've got in my library. Once I get them on record... At Inquisition Update, I move on. But we're getting close. We're getting close to the Inquisition in the United States of America, and maybe it's time to reiterate whatever Manhattan has warned Protestants in this country in this book, Terror Over Yugoslavia, The Threat to Europe. I, I have this is regarded, even when I got it, as a uh, a godsend, and uh, I protect it and all of my books. And uh, there's a very there's a very understandable reason why this book is so scarce and why there's no mention of it on the internet. And you can't read about you can't read this book on the internet. It's because of Avril Manhattan's warning to Protestants. Mm. Rome has seen to it that this book is out of circulation. And the press has cooperated with it. And uh, this warning that Avril Manhattan is sounding to the Protestants, 
is not going to be heard. Listen, Tom, while we're at it, to close your visit on Skype up, why don't we turn to another warning of Avro Manhattan that you were speaking about in the past? I don't think that you have the quote right in front of you, but you were mentioning that Avro Manhattan had a discussion with a KJB agent. And that discussion was about the state of Israel and That's right. of the Jews. That's right. Why, why don't you share that with our listeners right here, right now, for the final contribution to your broadcast here today? I think that would be a wonderful end before we end the Skype call here. And I will continue reading a little bit in the book um, to, to bring this Eleanor Roosevelt part to an end that I was just starting with. But um, I think, Tom, that our listeners would be very grateful for the information that you still have for them uh, yes. about this uh, discussion that the author Avro Manhattan, who wrote so many uh, wonderful, historically important books, and I showed the picture of uh, the Google search in the meantime. Uh, I don't name the books all right now, but there is this one warning out there that makes maybe to a lot of the quote-unquote protestants so much sense that they start turning around and instead of listening to their pastors, they will pick up the Bible from the bookshelves and read the word of Jesus Christ for themselves. Please, mm -hmm. Tom. Well, I can't remember exactly which book it was that Avril Manhattan made this assertion. I believe it was in the Vatican Billions, in which that book is available online. You can still read it. And there are current copies on eBay if you'd like to get a hold of it. Uh, the Vatican Billions by Avril Manhattan. I believe this is the book. And none, nonetheless, it's a very valuable book, and I, I encourage your listeners to get it. But he was in a candid, a very candid discussion with a KGB agent. And the discussion was about the modern nation state of Israel. And Avril Manhattan asserted in so many words that if the Jews and the Protestants ever get together, the Vatican is toast. If the Jews, what he was saying was, if the Jews ever accept Jesus as the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, 2,000 years ago, if they ever accept Jesus as the Messiah, Daniel prophesied to come. If they ever accept Jesus as their high priest and king and Messiah, then they will find themselves being Protestant in their belief. And what does Protestantism stand for? It stands for that same Jesus that Daniel prophesied, the Jewish Messiah, and the Protestants also know who the Antichrist is, the papacy. And it is the papacy that has created the modern nation state of Israel as a stage to present the world to the Pope as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this world. It's all a charade of the Vatican with the help of the United States and the United Nations to make the modern nation state of Israel to counterfeit the 70th week of Daniel, which Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Were it not for the necessity of the papacy to re-fulfill that 70th week of Daniel with an antichrist, and then once that antichrist is done away with, then the papacy can convince both Protestants and Jews that the Pope is the, 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 the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God, the real Messiah of the Jews. Again, Avril Manhattan said, that if the Protestants, those who protest Rome, and the Jews ever get together, Rome is toast. Avril Manhattan had an insight 
that exceeds any Protestant pastor I have ever even heard of. Because the Protestant pastors in this country say that the creation of the modern nation state of Israel and the potential for the rebuilt temple is a work of God. And it's not a work of God. God dispersed the Jews when they rejected Jesus. God destroyed the temple of 70 A.D., and, permit, and would no longer permit the Jews to make animal sacrifices. Jesus was the Christ, the Lamb of God. There was no more sacrifices. There's not to be any more sacrifices. You either accept Jesus or you don't. And what do the Jews hope for? The rebuilding of a temple and the reinstitution of animal sacrifices. For what? The reconciliation uh, for iniquity? Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. What? To make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in the most holy, to anoint the most holy, as Daniel says in his prophecy? Jesus was the most holy, and his blood anointed the Ark of the Covenant. He was the great high priest. When the Jews realized that the phony refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week of, of Daniel is really designed for their spiritual and physical annihilation by the Roman Catholic Church, they might come to Protestantism. They might receive Jesus. And if they do, then we're complete. The body of Christ is complete, Jew and Gentile, all serving the same Christ. And that's a power that exceeds that of the Protestant Reformation, and the whole world would be liberated from papal control, and Avril Manhattan comprehended this. That's why he told the KGB agent that if the Protestants and the Jews ever get together, Rome is toast. And that's my conclusion for the day. Thank you very much, Tom. I You're welcome. very much appreciate that you have been here. I will uh, continue a little bit in the reading about this, um, Yeah, you know, about what I spoke about with you last weekend about Eleanor Roosevelt. I'm not going to make that too long to read about that, um, mm -hmm. because it has already been some uh, hour and 40 minutes on the video. Um, do you want to stay on while I'll read this little last part before I close mm -hmm. down, that we can close no, down? No, I, I have an appointment this afternoon and I'm going to be late. Okay, so that's all right. Go. I don't want to keep you, Tom. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for joining You're me. Welcome. And uh, welcome. yeah, I hope I see you in, in a few days with our Sabbath Bible study, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh, success, forth, yeah. and uh, success and uh, much pleasure tomorrow with your Inquisition update on First Amendment yes. Radio again. Where for the moment Tom is reading from Martin Luther's book that he wrote in the 1530s about the council and the churches. So when you have the time to join Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, join in the live readings. Tom is on there. Uh, what is your American time when you do the um, broadcast? Uh, it's it's uh, 8 o'clock in the morning Pacific Coast time, uh, 9 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock, or rather 10 o'clock Central, and 11 o'clock Eastern. Yeah, so. and it's uh, about 1700 mm -hmm. European Central time. Yes. Okay, Tom. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. God bless you, and uh, Blessings. have a nice day further, okay? Bye-bye. Yeah. So, my dear listeners, this was... Uh, my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who gave us some very interesting insights into Avro Manhattan and the Eustasha. And I have this one page here open of this, uh, of this paper that I'm still reading to you for the moment. I wanted to go in that, but there was not an appropriate moment to interrupt Tom. I just have to see that I put the right picture up here now. Um, I wanted to go back to that, uh, what uh, Franz von Papen, the Knight of Malta, said at the Nuremberg Trials on October 12, 1945, when he said, the re-evangelization of the Soviet Union was a Vatican operation. And we spoke about that last time, and you know that the re-evangelization of the Soviet Union is the Catholicization of the Soviet Union. So everything that we just spoke about here, also Franz von Papen, um, 
even confirms in 1945 when he was on the Nuremberg trials. So now let's go back here to that um, statement of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah? She was asked by Avro Manhattan if she had ever heard of the massacres and the atrocities in the NDH, the independent state of Croatia. And uh, she replied, one of the worst, if not the worst crimes of the war. Now, why? Because that what when, when I left off before Tom came into the picture and uh, came with the reading here, why was I so shocked when I read this sentence? She says here that one of the worst, if not the worst, crimes of the war have been the massacres and atrocities of the NDH. So then I'm asking myself, because this interview took place in the end of the 1940s, it says here so, at the late 1940s, so that is somewhere between 1946 and 1949, right? Because that's the 1940s. And she said one of the worst, if not the worst, crimes of the war were the massacres and the atrocities of the NDH. Where is the Holocaust of the quote-unquote six million Jews? Why doesn't she speak of that as the worst crimes of the war? I mean, when you speak of a war crime, you speak most of the time of the number of people who have been killed. I don't want to play down the two million, one and a half or one million people who have been killed during the NDH time between 1941 and 1945, and no way. But the quote-unquote six million Jews of the German Holocaust have been generally accepted today in the world that we live in, the worst crimes of the war. Why doesn't Eleanor Roosevelt address that? Well, I guess that is because the knowledge of that genocide, of that Holocaust, was not that far into the brains of the people at that time. The teaching of the Holocaust of six million Jews came later. She just didn't know. And you know, I'm not even going deeper into this, but I'm just asking a question. How can someone, being asked after the Second World War, what she thinks of the massacres and atrocities in the NDH, and then reply, one of the worst, if not the worst, crimes of war, instead of mentioning the Holocaust that the Germans perpetrated on six million Jews, as we are taught everywhere in the world today. Now, the broadcast has been long enough, and thank you, Brother Tom, for joining me in this broadcast and bringing clear to us what Avro Manhattan said and how Avro Manhattan used the example of the NDH, of the satellite state of Croatia, to warn the people who live in the years today to understand that that was a forecasting of things to come, probably here in Europe when the Inquisition comes here, but certainly in the United States of America when the Inquisition comes there, so that we are not taken by surprise. So therefore, I will leave this reading today with this, because it has been long enough and your attention has been long enough been tested on this. And I want you to enjoy this. I want you to reflect on what you've seen. I want you to reflect on what you have heard. And I want you to do your own research and see that your own research comes up with the same conclusion and with the same facts as Tom's research and my research here came up. And next time in broadcast number 21 of The Secret History of the Jesuits, we will continue and then probably finally finish this paper on the genocide of Croatia and then return back to the book for a moment. And then, of course, I have another thing coming for you, and that is the appalling history of Croatia in the 20th century, a letter by Richard Bennett and Michael de Semlian, which we will also use to finish off. But for now, for this moment, 
Joggler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Signing off and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, Welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From their own, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.